Podcast. In our new series, we're going to be taking just 10 minutes of your time to enhance your knowledge of Java programming. We'll be specifically focusing on Jakarta EE, formerly Java EE, and Java for Enterprise. Today, we're talking to Payara Project Manager, Rudy Dabusha. He's got 20 years experience in the industry and recently pointed out on Twitter that managers and developers can often fall victim to hype-driven development. Jakarta EE development teams often choose solutions because they're new and exciting and used by big companies, not because they're right for their use case specifically. So we've caught him for 10 minutes to ask five questions about how you can avoid falling for the hype. So Rudy, the first question is, can you explain what you mean by hype-driven development? Yeah, sure. Um, well, in the IT industry, we hear a lot about uh, new developments, new frameworks, how they can solve your problems, uh, all the new trends, etc. And that are shiny and new things, and it's uh, very attractive for developers, but not always useful. It's like uh, people like new gadgets, but they are not always useful for any scenario. So many of those frameworks, etc., are developed by Google or Netflix and Amazon to solve their issues. But most companies are not Google, not Netflix and not Amazon. So they don't have the same issues. And maybe the solution they have uh, come up with is not your ideal solution. So instead of all, uh, instead of following all those new shiny things, um, the business case, the user functionality should be the central place. You should be focusing on providing that functionality in an optimal way, but that optimal way is not only a technical way, it's a general, the most cost effective way. And if someone says, oh, I'm going to rewrite our entire application, well, that sounds very suspicious for me because that case, most of the time, it is only thinking about the technical solution in a world where there are no limitations on time and resources. And that's, of course, uh, not the real world. Great. Um, so in enterprise development, what kind of technologies can be red flags for you? Well, there are many. and. I'm going to mention a few of uh, the program techniques and uh, to be clear, I don't say that those techniques are not valid and that they cannot be used uh, in any case, but um, if you talk about them, you should always be validating it for your case if it's the best scenario, as I mentioned. So for instance, uh, reactive programming, um, for me, it adds a lot of more complexity. Uh, and if not all your parts of your application or not your entire chain is reactive, then you lose already a lot of the benefits. Um, also, the asynchronous functionality, uh, the asynchronous feature of it uh, can also be a problem in some scenarios. The other one what I'm thinking about is event sourcing, uh, there where you not store the latest data of your entity, for instance, but uh, you store only a sequence of the changes uh, so that you have an event, a uh, stream of events uh, with the entire history. And to get to the latest version, uh, to the latest um, information, you need to reconstruct uh, the, uh, the information based on that stream. That's, of course, great for auditing purposes because you have the entire history there, but it adds a lot of challenges, complexity, and, and, and probably also performance issues. Functions as a service, uh, it, um, where you start up a runtime when only that functionality is required, and outside of that time, uh, your runtime is not running, and so it's not using any resources. That's fine, but if people then say, oh, we have a delay, so we need to have our function as a service to a startup faster, etc. Then there is an issue because that function as a service should not be part of an online transaction by a user. It is designed for some um, offline background process, uh, something asynchronous that needs to be done, but it should not be part of a um, process of the user and uh, what the user is doing. So. It should not start up fast. It should just do its work and then it can stop. Another one for me is native compilation uh, or ahead of time compilation. 
Um, and again, we have that faster startup here. Um, is that really going to benefit your use case? Are you really going to uh, save some money if your application, yeah, your runtime starts up a few seconds faster? Because with that native compilation, uh, you need to use specific frameworks uh, because not all of the Java can be, and uh, not all the Java idioms can be used uh, when you are going to um, do native compilation. So you need to rewrite your application, which of course is a lot of um, time and effort. And is that the short, uh, the shorter startup uh, compensates that uh, system? And another thing, uh, you put a lot of inform, uh, you put a lot of um, waiting, so that now you can cut out that the other one. And another thing is that you have put so many um, effort on uh, performance and faster startup, but actually when your application uh, in native compiled code is running, your performance is lower than with the JIT compiler. So um, it's a bit of contradiction that you um, favored the performance and then comes up with a solution which um, is running slower. And the last one, of course, uh, you have also Kubernetes, which is a great tool um, if you are running in a cloud environment and you want to have scalability, etc. But Kubernetes is only a basic tool. Uh, it is at the beginning um, of a, an entire stack that you need to use to get uh, the optimal um, of your environment. Um, things like Helm or Ansible scripting or Terraform uh, to to, to manage your environment. Um, then you, of course, you have those monitoring challenges uh, because you have a lot of systems and then you need to have insight on how your environment is running. So that means that you are going to add Prometheus and Grafana to have uh, those graphics, etc. And then you have the uh, situation that many um, instances are involved uh, in handling a request, so that means you have distributed tracing, etc. So the adding something like Jaeger or something similar. So that means again a lot of things on top of Kubernetes, like typical five to ten new tools and frameworks uh, to make the most of the entire environment. So for me, those what I mentioned here are some red flags, and uh, people should carefully think about. Um, if they are the right solution for their problem or not. So what are some of the negative effects adopting these solutions can have? If you adopt them uh, in a situation where they are not optimal, where, where, where they are not desired, then probably it will lead to a failure of the project. Um, you put a lot of time and effort uh, in investigation of that no uh, programming technique in, in, in the frameworks. You put a lot of time in, in rewriting it. Um, you struggle probably uh, to get um, to get uh, the best out of the frameworks, etc. And the end results might not be that um, satisfactory for the end user. Uh, for instance, to give one example, with that reactive programming and that asynchronous, if um, people update data um, on the screen and then on the next screen they still see the old data because it was asynchronous and it was not updated yet, then of course um, that's um, not a good thing and it's not what the user wants. What practical steps would you recommend to these businesses when they're assessing a new technology then? Well, don't just start by saying, I'm going to rewrite my main application, my core business uh, with something which, which I do not know and that I did not investigate. Start with some small things, uh, some side projects, learning pro projects, uh, which um, are interesting and useful uh, as a whole for your company, uh, but are not critical so that you can learn about those, um, those frameworks, how you can use it, uh, you, have, you can gain all the, the knowledge, uh, the, the pros and the contras um, of it, and then you can decide um, if it will be useful for your core, uh, for your main product or not uh, in a next version. Um, but don't start by just saying, I'm going to rewrite my main business. So at PayR specifically, how do we avoid the hype? Well, 
with Payara, uh, we are dedicated to uh, Jakarta EE. And um, also, that's not a silver bullet. Uh, we also realize that Jakarta EE is not uh, the most suited uh, option, uh, not the solution for all the pro problems that are exist in the world. Um, but it is a technology which is proven uh, because uh, Java Jakarta EE goes back uh, more than 20 years with, uh, with Java EE and uh, J2EE. And um, so it is proven um, a lot of customers are using it. A lot of solutions um, can be um, handled with it. Um, and there is continuous improvement. Uh, there are there are always uh, new things which are picked up, which are stable, uh, which are proven that it is valuable and that it can be included in something like an enterprise app, app application uh, with uh, the Jakarta EE framework. So um, it's fine to try it out uh, and, and, and all those new shiny things, but um, mainly you should focus on stability and make sure that, that it works. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much for your time, Rudy. And hopefully that will help our audience think twice about the next big thing that might not be necessarily right for them. Um, so we'll leave you with the phrase that we often hear in the industry, which is attributed to the American computer scientist Donald Knuth. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Rudy. Yep, thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>